So good evening, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor. I'm Chief Executive of the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this evening's uh, special event organized in partnership with Save the Children. Before we begin, can you uh, make sure that your mobile phone is set to uh, silent? Um, but uh, by all means, um, uh, leave it on so that you can tweet. The hashtag is RSA change. We're also live streaming over the RSA website, so welcome to all our online uh, viewers. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, Justin uh, Forsyth. I should say, by the way, that we're very grateful to you for coming in tonight in the incredibly cold weather that we've got, but as it said, I visited your website, Justin, as it says on that website, imagine how cold it is this evening in refugee camps across Europe as well. Uh, Justin is Chief Executive of Save the Children. He's led transformative change, enabling the organization to more than double the number of children it reaches from 8 million to 17 and a half million after five years at the helm. Justin is moving on to take up a new role as Deputy Executive Director of the UN's Children's Fund. Justin started his career with Oxfam and helped build campaigns on debt cancellation, Africa, make trade fair, access to medicines. He set up Oxfam International and helped build the organization as a global campaigning force. Working at number 10 alongside Tony Blair and then Gordon Brown, Justin left, led efforts on poverty and climate change and employed new communication strategies to reach the British public on a range of issues from life crime to climate change. In his lecture this evening, Justin will draw on his experience at Save the Children and offer lessons about how charities need to adapt to have impact in a time of complexity and to turn strategic visions into real world change. After Justin's spoken, we'll have a, a conversation up here and then we'll open up uh, for your uh, questions. I'm looking forward to a very lively conversation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Justin Forsyth. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, it's lovely to see so many people here tonight. I wanted to start, if you can throw yourselves back, not just to the cold of Europe tonight, minus 20 degrees centigrade, I think, in Serbia. Children tonight in Serbia literally shivering with cold, facing hypothermia. But if you can, is to park that in. I'll come back to that later in my talk. But to throw yourself back to 2011 in Somalia. I landed in Mogadishu, the capital of Somalia, in 2011, in September 2011. This was in the midst of one of the worst famines this country had ever faced. In those days, you landed on a small runway just on the edge of the ocean, this blue, sparkling, beautiful ocean that Somalia's coast runs along. But Mogadishu itself was in rubble. Hundreds of thousands of people had fled drought and war and were huddled in the ruins. This is a picture of me in one building. These are just bullet Bullet, bu bullet holes in the wall of this building. We landed there in a cargo plane. I felt a little bit like Indiana Jones. Not many people flew into Mogadishu in those days. There weren't any seats. The pilot was smoking a cigarette as we landed. We were clinging on to this kind of netting on the back of the cargo. And we got out with a little bit of relief. And we had immediately 16 armed guards. It's the only place in my whole life working for Save the Children and Oxfam, actually, that I've ever gone anywhere with armed protection. And these were young Somalis armed to the teeth. And we drove off into the centre of town and we went to a little refugee camp called Sigali. This was right in the centre of Mogadishu. It was a camp that literally a few days before had been run by Al-Shabaab. I think Al-Shabaab in those days was the affiliate of Al-Qaeda. I think it's now an affiliate of ISIS. So it was bullet holed. There was mortar shell still in the camp. And I met this little girl, Nastea, age two, and her mum, Suban. Nastea had walked at the age of two for four days, fleeing conflict, fleeing violence, fleeing the drought, to find safety in this refugee camp. She was dehydrated, she had diarrhea, and she was close to death. 
You know when little children like that are close to death. I've seen it quite a few times, sadly, because they're listless. They kind of fade in and out. Their eyes don't quite focus on you when you look at them. And our expert frontline Somali team rushed her. We put up a mobile hospital in this refugee camp, a tent. She's sitting in it, I think. It doesn't look much like a tent, but it was a tent. And they pulled her back from the brink of death with a saline drip. I think I've got one of the other things that we gave her, this plumpy nut mixture, which is just peanut butter with nutrients. It's magical. I've seen again how this saves so many children's lives. And a few antibiotics. And they saved her life in front of my eyes. And over the next month, she was sent to a bigger hospital and she gradually recovered. And a year later, I was back in Mogadishu in slightly better circumstances. And I met this little girl and her mother again, healthy and transformed from that simple intervention that those Save the Children frontline nurses and doctors made. And the reason I wanted to tell you the story about little Nastea and Suban is because it's a story of hope. It told me in my first year or so at Save the Children that even in these very tough circumstances, in one of the worst places in the world to be a child, you can save children's lives. And as Bill Gates has argued, much more eloquently than I can tonight, that Nastea and children like her are part of a much bigger trend, that overall we are managing to re dramatically reduce the number of children dying from preventable causes. And that now, because of that progress, not just in the toughest places in the world, but all across our planet, we could now aim even higher, and we could be that first generation to end children dying from preventable causes. But we won't do it just with business as usual. It won't just be more of the same, even with the expert interventions that I've talked about tonight. And the case I want to make to you tonight is that if we do really want to change the world, to save children's lives, not just a few, but to end child deaths forever, to stop children dying from diarrhoea and pneumonia and malaria, which is possible in our lifetime, it won't just be more of the same. We, if we're going to change the world, we also need to change ourselves as charities too. And it's not just because of that ambition whether it's that mission or other missions that you are involved with in the charities that you work or support. It's also because the world is dramatically changing around us. Climate change, inequality, the mass movement of people. I never expected, even though we've worked on it, on it for years, that we would have over a million people coming to Europe in the last year. These huge forces afoot in the world are dramatically changing the world. How we respond to them, how we react to them, is a huge challenge to charities, as well as everyone else and governments and the private sector in the world. But it's not just inequality and conflict and climate change. It's not just the mass movement of people. It's also the shift in power from, from to the east, to the south, with the rise of China and Brazil and South Africa, which changes decision-making, influences multilateral institutions, means where resources are going. It's also the technological revolution, the power of digital change today. It's hard to remember I was one of the people, like some of you in this room, who were very involved in Make Poverty History. But in 2005, neither Facebook or Twitter existed. It's hard to imagine running a campaign without all of that digital power. I think Facebook actually existed on Harvard campus, but didn't exist in the way that it does today. And more personally, I never envisaged, when I joined Save the Children, that I would be standing on a cliff top on my holidays in Paxos, talking to the head of MI6, about whether Save the Children had been involved in the killing of Osama bin Laden. 
That, that just felt completely ridiculous and beyond anything a charity could ever be involved with. I assure you we were nothing to do with the death of Osama bin Laden, just for the record. But the bizarreness of the conversation itself, it was a beautiful setting. I never envisaged that actually in my first few weeks at Save the Children, that I would be on the phone to someone who claimed to be the president of Heb and Heb. I've never even heard of that before then. It's actually a province of Somalia about the kidnapping of two of our staff at Save the Children. And it wasn't until afterwards that I found out actually he was a rap artist from Minnesota. <coughs> he was also the president of Heben Heb. <laughs> There's a big connection between Minnesota and Somalia. And we got both of them out. I never imagined that I would be dispatching hundreds of our staff to go and respond to an Ebola crisis and recruiting hundreds, of, hundreds more to Sierra Leoneans and Liberians in response to that crisis. And this was different from other emergencies. The fear of working in the midst of an Ebola crisis can't be overemphasized. The, this team here, who are Sierra Leoneans, only a few months before they were farmers or teachers, just local people, tra were trained to put on this outfit, this protective outfit, this actually me behind it, I've got my name Justin written on my head. You had to get dressed by that whole team before you went into the red zone. And once you were in the red zone, you would have vomit and diarrhea and blood on you. And when you left, these, this team, they literally took you through a kind of 30-step operation where you, how you peeled your gloves off, how you took that hood off, how you took those goggles off without one bit of the external bit touching your body. That whole time in Sierra Leone, you could never touch anyone else, shake hands, bump into, without the fear of catching Ebola. Our staff in our office in Sierra Leone were scared to leave their children at home because they worried who they would touch while they were at work. I never thought we would be in the middle of that type of health crisis. And we're going to have more of those, those animal to human type diseases are going to increase, not decrease. So for all of those reasons, because of the ambition we all have for the causes we believe in, and I've just talked about ours at Save the Children, because the world is changing, and because increasingly we're facing these headwinds and risks, and I haven't even mentioned CO salaries or um, the other ones that we're under increased scrutiny about in terms of fundraising practices, which I think in general are good that we're under more scrutiny, but they create more pressures on the charity sector. Because of all of those reasons, I think we can't afford to stand still that we have to change as organisations if we're going to have more impact for the things that we believe in. So what I wanted to do tonight was to outline five lessons and insights I've learnt at Save the Children about the, some of the things that I think we need to think about as a charity sector to have more impact. And I apologise in advance that they're a bit skewed to my experience when many of you have similar experiences but would use different examples. The first one is about the importance of creating platforms, not just organisations. I don't believe any one organisation, any one campaign, actually no longer any country, maybe never any ever one country, can achieve the type of ambition that I mentioned before, or other ambitions in terms of climate change or inequality or poverty. And that sometimes that we need to think about, as organisations, we subsume our brands, our organisation, for the greater good. Let me give you one example from the Save the Children background, before I even came that had already started. We've been working for years at Save the Children on training frontline humanitarian workers, tens of thousands of them, because increasingly we know that when these emergencies hit, whether in Nepal or the Philippines, the first responders are people who are on the ground, not people that fly in. Ebola was a bit of an exception, because there wasn't so much local capacity. But in general, it's the local people that respond. And we decided that we needed to establish an academy to train hundreds of thousands of people, that this would transform the whole humanitarian system. 
And there was a proposal made to do it to save the children, but we realised we wouldn't get the funding, we wouldn't get the leverage, we wouldn't make the impact. So we decided to create, in effect, a global public good. To, with BRAC, with Oxfam, with the British government, with the Norwegian government, with the Philippines government, with the Kenyan government, with many NGOs around the world, big, small and medium-sized, to create something which is now established called the Humanitarian Leadership Academy that will in the next few years will train 100,000 frontline community workers from 10 hubs around the world and capture and spread knowledge about how you respond to these emergencies to have most impact. For me, that's a huge lesson for an organisation like Save the Children, that sometimes you won't achieve your objective unless you create a platform rather than just building your own organisation. The second lesson and insight I wanted to raise with you tonight is about unusual alliances. It's kind of linked to the first one, but a slightly different point. It's a picture of, um, I think you can tell, Bono and President Bush. And it got quite a lot of criticism. It's kind of Bono giving credit to President Bush, probably when President Bush wasn't that popular. And he did that at that moment because he had just done a deal with President Bush to create one of the biggest funds to fight HIV and AIDS in history called PEPFAR. And the reason he got President Bush to do that wasn't because he's a great singer, wasn't because he did that. <laughs> it was because for months and years, an unusual coalition had formed in the United States of America, and I lived there for some of this period, of the Christian right, led by an amazing man called Rick Warren, who's an evangelical Christian, many congressmen on the Republican right, some of them running for president now, but not Donald Trump. <laughs> A large section of the NGO world, the liberal establishment, and they came together around a cause that said that we could work together to do something. And as a result, a huge fund that made a massive difference to millions of people's of lives was created. And President Bush would never have done that without that unusual coalition coming together to push him and then to support him as he rolled that out. Some, another example closer to home is something that I got a lot of criticism for, um, and still do actually, uh, more than almost anything else I've done, which is to forge a partnership with a big pharmaceutical company, GlaxoSmithKline. I'd actually organised at Oxfam a campaign against GlaxoSmithKline and I'd picketed them. I'd even, I think, bought a share for their annual general meeting and disrupted it. So I've got no illusions about the pharmaceutical sector. But it felt to me, when I met Andrew Whitty, the head of GlaxoSmithKline, that this was a company in a completely different position than when I used to do that in the 90s. This was a company that was reforming and revamping itself, even with all the problems internally that it's had. And I thought if we could harness the power of that company to achieve change for children, that would be extraordinary. And as a result of that partnership, we haven't just taken their money. It's actually relatively small amounts of money in Save the Children terms that they give us. But much more importantly, we've harnessed their research and development, their innovation, the power of them as a company to achieve change for children. Let me give you an example. They've transformed one of the most popular mouthwashes in the world, in the world, don't laugh, Cordacil, into a gel to fight something called neonatal sepsis. When a baby has its umbilical cord cut with a razor, it sometimes gets infected. The baby, I've seen this happen in the mountains of Afghanistan, the baby then goes blue and dies. And it's this infection that rushes around its body. And for one pea of gel, maybe even less, you can stop that baby dying through that ingredient that was in that mouthwash, which they've transformed into a gel, which is now being, um, being approved across the European Union, and we're piloting with them in somewhere in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We've also worked with them and another company on new soap products that help babies not get Reckitt Benckiser or another company get rotavirus, the worst form of diarrhea. Pneumonia and, rot and, 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 and pneumonia and diarrhea are the two biggest killers of children. So these unusual alliances, in my view, have the potential 
for achieving huge amounts of change. And I don't think charity leaders and charities themselves should be scared just because of criticism for stepping up to the mark to make this change. And we should be judged by the impact it has for children's lives, not the noise and the criticism that go with making those decisions. My third um, example, I was going to tell a story about exceptional teams tonight and particularly about Arsenal, my team, but we drew with Stoke. <laughs> it's hard, I think, to be an exceptional team and draw with Stoke. Sorry, any Stoke supporters. <laughs> but actually, I wanted to say something a little bit more close to home, which is that even though Save the Children, as Matthew um, very kindly said, has done extraordinarily well in increasing the impact for children, in doubling our income, in nearly recruiting a million supporters, all of these things that we've done and the, and the change we've made to children's lives. I think my biggest challenge and the, my biggest failure as the CEO of Save the Children is that I've not managed to bring all of my team with me. And so I think you know, building exceptional teams is so important if you're going to sustain the change that you started. And how you build a culture of an organisation, how you create that momentum, how you inspire people, but also build around them a capability that allows them to do their job is something I've really learned at Save the Children. I hope to take on into my future career. But I would emphasise it. I think sometimes because we work on such worthy causes, at charities. We're so driven by these massive challenges, these external events, these headwinds. We can forget almost the need to focus internally. And I think some in the private sector and even in government are ahead of us. I'm sure there are charities in this room who have done this really well and maybe you can highlight that later. But I think it's something that w I could have done better um, at Save the Children and something that I've learned. Fourthly, the power of the mass rather than just the elite. I very much agree with high-level elite lobbying. It makes an enormous amount of difference when I worked for Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. I saw sometimes just one bit of lobbying or one bit of influencing having an, having an enormous amount of influence. But the main thing, I believe, after all of this time, whether it's in government or in NGOs and charities, is actually you need mass support for your cause. This is, um, obviously goes back to 2005 with Live Aid and Make Poverty History. And I re really remember distinctly um, the week before Glen Eagles, the G8 summit in Scotland, which was the focus of the Make Poverty History campaign that agreed this unbelievably, and many of you may have been on those marches in Edinburgh and, and, and in London and the Live Aid concerts, agreed that very ambitious package for Africa of debt relief and aid and HIV and AIDS. And we were negotiating that communique at Lancaster House, just down the road from here. All the Sherpas, the negotiators for each of the G8 leaders, it'd been a kind of testy, bad-tempered negotiation. They were getting to the line. The negotiations were meant to finish that day a week before the summit. That's usually what happened with G8 summits. The deal gets done, the leaders pitch up, they all celebrate, they sign it, and everyone moves on. And this was meant to happen on this day. And the Live 8 concert started warming up in Hyde Park down the road. And the music literally pulsated through the windows. It was a hot day and we'd opened the windows. And it changed the negotiations. Those people realised the world was watching them. It wasn't just in London. Live 8 was all around the world. Make Poverty History, Jubilee 2000. All of these campaigns were mobilising. And these leaders, these Sherpas and negotiators, put off doing a deal that night and pushed it into the G8 itself because they feared to, about doing a deal that was too modest against what the public expectation was beginning to, to become. And as a result of that, as we convened at the G8 in Glen Eagles, I remember in that lovely hotel sitting in the rooms that we were given, and me and my colleague Laurie Lee, who's now the head of care, he was on the phone to Air Force One as it landed in Glen Eagles, or not Glen Eagles, I know that's a golf course, at Edinburgh Airport. <laughs> and um, y y that was one of the great things. You could always phone the American president because he had a phone wherever he was. I remember in the, when we worked for Tony Blair, you sometimes had to go into the cockpit coming back from New York and use the, 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 the pilot's phone and radio because they didn't even have a phone on the plane. But you could have this amazing communication um, with the American president. And 
Nobody had agreed one of the central outcomes of that G8 summit, which was universal access to AIDS treatment. In those days, a few hundred thousand people in the world were getting AIDS drugs, and they cost about 15,000 a shot, so no poor people at all were getting them. And this was a big ask of the Make Poverty History campaign. People like Kirsty, who's here tonight, McNeil, who works with me now, she was the leader of the, that AIDS campaign. And we persuaded, after hours and hours, not just those last few minutes on the plane, but for days beforehand, hours and hours of negotiation, we persuaded the Americans to support, I think the wording was all but universal access to, uni to universal AIDS treatment, but it was basically we got what we wanted. And because of that march in Edinburgh, because of the concert in Edinburgh that night and this mass coverage, every paper in the world covering this G8 summit, we then went round that night knowing we had a mandate from Make Poverty History in effect and told every other government, every other Sherpa representing their government that they were the only country now holding out when in effect we only had America on board. And because of that power of public mobilisation, we in effect bounced the biggest governments in the world into an agreement on universal access to AIDS treatment that now means today in the world 15 million people have access to AIDS treatment. That means 15 million people are alive today, their families are able to earn a living and they're able to fulfil their potential. The last point that I wanted to... Um, make on my kind of five insights is about the need for charities to really focus on what they are, what they do, what they came from, their values, not to become all things to all people. I felt when I joined Save the Children and I looked at its very rich history that we needed to really go back to our founder, Eglantine Jeb. I don't know if you know Eglantine Jeb. She's an extraordinary woman that founded Save the Children back in 1919. And she was vilified, feels like, feels like modern times, but she was vilified in the press. It was the front page of the Times that attacked her. She was taken to court. And she was vilified because she decided to send aid to children in Austria and Germany in the middle of the, and the end of the First World War. And she was accused... Of, helping, of being a traitor and helping our enemies. And she said, children are never our enemies. And from that moment, she established Save the Children, and she made the focus of Save the Children a children's organisation. And I felt, at different moments in history since then, that we'd lost our way, that we'd tried to be a mini Oxfam, or we'd tried to be a development organisation, or humanitarian. We're a children's organisation. And I think for... We need organisations, and you could equally say, I had, remember having this conversation with Loretta at Christian Aid about being a Christian organisation, or Oxfam, who's an extraordinary organisation which I've worked for for many years, was founded in the midst of the Second World War, breaking a blockade to send aid to Greece as a social justice organisation. You need to root yourselves in your roots. If you stray too far from that, I think you don't look authentic, but also I don't think you have the power of your mandate. And if you're clear about what you are, I think it allows you to be bolder and more ambitious and take risks to achieve that goal that you stand for. I think because we're so clear who we are at Save the Children, it's allowed us in recent history to do some quite controversial things. For example, we published every name of every child that had been killed in the recent Gaza conflict. And because we're a children's organisation, I think you can do that. Where in the Middle East conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, if you ever do anything, you get accused of being on one side or the other. But I think but if you're a children's organisation and that's your mandate, you can do it. And the same applies, I think, for organisations in different situations. So those are my five insights from my time at Save the Children in number 10 and also at Oxfam, I, and from working with many different organisations about some of the things, and there are only some of, I know, the things that charities need to do to change. None of us can stand still. The world is changing around us. I think when I stand back from my... No, stick on that one for a minute more. I, stay, I, I, I stand back from my five and a half years at Save the Children and my much longer period at Oxfam, I think what it makes me think 
is, yes, I've seen some terrible things. Yes, I've been in the midst of some terrible conflicts, terrible humanitarian emergencies. And I think, overall, in my job, you probably see the worst of it, not always the best of it. But at the heart of what I believe is that we should be optimistic about the world going forward. That despite the challenges we face, the headwinds and the risks, despite these very big challenges that we face, the one thing that I've learned working at Save the Children and through all of these coalitions that I've mentioned is that the power of human agency, that history is not inevitable, that you can change it. So when Matthew mentioned before we came in here in his introductions about what's happening on the borders of Europe tonight. And we've had reports from our teams about children in not the best warm clothes you can imagine in Serbia and Macedonia, shivering with hypothermia, shaking almost with cold. I don't know if you've ever seen a child shake with cold. It makes me feel that that is completely unacceptable in Europe today. That I stood a few weeks ago on the island of Lesbos and looked across the sea to Turkey and I watched these boats with 40 to 50 people packed. They're so way down, they're literally there's an inch between them and the sea. So a tiny wave comes in and the boat goes down. And you, when these young people, mums and dads and children get off their boats, they literally celebrate. They go like this because they've just survived. They've got across those six, six miles of water. Gosh, isn't that completely unacceptable? We live in the European Union, and people are risking their lives to go six miles between Turkey and Greece, that we don't even think we could provide a ferry, that we want to discourage them from coming so much that we're willing for them to drown on the way coming to us. But I think despite all of that and the stories that I've told, that the power of all of us, our human agency, the difference we can make by coming together, can tip history in the right direction. And if we stick to our values, if we learn some of the recent lessons of history, we can achieve even more change. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Justin. That was um, we had a lot of uh, lectures here, and that was one of the most inspiring, and honest, and insightful that we've ever had. So thank you for that. And um, I think it's worth saying that if you anybody wants to donate to save the children, and I think the refugees is your kind of focus now, then they just have to go to the put save the children into Google, and you'll be straight there, and there's a donate button to click on. Um, uh, when you first got this job, was save the children. I guess some people might have said to you, if you had friends who were kind of bankers or politicians or estate agents or whatever, they must have said to you, well, this is the most virtuous job in the world. You know, you're running a charity and you're doing development. You know. And yet, as you said in the speech, actually your time has been a time also of, of controversy. And I want to look at the two elements of this. First of all, uh, development. I, I dug out a quote from last year's uh, winner of the Nobel prize for economics, Angus Deaton, he said this, development is neither a financial nor a technical problem, but a political problem. Mm. And the aid industry often makes the politics worse. Now, as you know, his claim is that aid stops governments in developing countries going through the process they need to go through about of having their own tax mm. base, their own kind of governance, and it keeps them, as it were, in a kind of state of d dependency. Where do you think is the state of the, the debate about development right now? It's a, it's a big qu question, Matthew, and there are people in the audience tonight who I know will have strong um, views on it both ways. I mean, my feeling is that one of the reasons that charities and NGOs, and I'll answer the question about development more directly, are under more scrutiny is because we are more now in the political mainstream. I mean, because aid wasn't cut, it's suddenly in politics, and we become part of that political um, discourse and that's not a bad thing because this is real money and it's real lives and there should be a challenge to us in the in the and I know there's lots of different types of charity and and I'm only talking about one part of it there should be a challenge to us to make the case for why we should save those people coming across 
the sea, why we think refugees should be protected and looked after, why we should put money, I mean 15 billion a year it's going to be um, of aid, it's a lot of money, why we should put it into saving children's lives in Kenya or Nigeria or other countries, or, uh, cu countries around the world. So I think because we're in politics there's more um, scrutiny. I also think something else has happened which you know um, um, better than I do and, is, and, uh, and have commented on, which is there's a b breakdown of trust between the public and institutions and I think charities are also caught up in the mix of that. So I saw an editor of a newspaper the other day, of a popular newspaper, I won't name him, um, and he said kind of it's charity's turn. I mean we've had bankers, we've done politicians, we're going to do charities. And, and, it, and, and I think that again isn't a bad thing, but it means that we need to think as charities how we operate in this much more um, under scrutiny um, way and how we reach the public directly rather than always through third parties. On the debate on development, I mean, I, I think, you know, that, 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 it's, been, that it's been ridiculously polarised between those who've argued only for aid and those who believe there are many other factors in the world that have led to all of this progress. And I think, of course, ec economic growth, government's leadership, the private sector has transformed the world, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, meant more children live, more people, more children go to school. But aid as part of that has had a transformational impact. In the toughest places in the world, aid has had a disproportionate impact in making sure, in the case of examples that I've gave, that lives ha have been saved. So we need, I think, more than to talk just about aid, is to talk about development, to talk about the types of interventions that make most difference. The last point I would make is that I think this is very much part of the DNA of our country now. I think it's very deep. I know there's a big opposition, but there's also 15, 20, maybe even 25 million people in this country who passionately care about this cause. What we do in the world is part of what we are as Brits. And I think that's very powerful. It comes out on Comic Relief Night. You know, it comes out when we're in the early stages of this refugee crisis. And it does go back and forth. But I think politicians can't underestimate that either. On the kind of more general charitable uh, point about charities, I mean, if you were talking about, I don't know, finance, you might say the kind of fault line for finance is greed. You know, it's yeah. in the sense that it's greed which leads to people doing the wrong kind of thing. Is, is it perversely that in the charitable sector, it's the sense of righteousness that leads people to doing the right? It's that sense of we're doing the right thing, so therefore cold calling people to get money out of mm. them or chugging or you know, or the excesses of a kid's comedy. Well, that's, that, in a sense, that's justified by people's sense of, we know we're right. Yeah. I do, I agree with that, actually. That's interesting. We, we haven't had that conversation before, but I think the biggest weakness um, of any organisation, of any leadership, is, is self-righteousness and the lack of self-doubt. And I think charities, because they do believe so strongly in what they're doing, sometimes don't ask questions about themselves. Um, without telling a long story. I learned that lesson. I worked with people in South Africa, and particularly the African National Congress, and one of the most respected leaders of the ANC that ran the military wing of the ANC during the dying days of apartheid, always used to say to me that he thought the most important ingredient of leadership was self-doubt. And I think if you don't have leaders who reflect on, on, on whether they're making the right decisions, and, don't, and are so self-righteous. People that uh, believe they're so right they can do anything are the ones that are most dangerous. And I, I, I do think in the charity sector, you, that probably has been the contributory factor to some of those mistakes that are made. All I would say on the fundraising thing is I also think there's another thing afoot at, uh, there, which is that, is, that, is, is that we outsourced it to other companies and then didn't monitor them strongly enough. And I think we have to look at how we engage the public directly, not just always through outsourcing. Two final questions before we, we, we open it up. You're going now, you've, you, you've been outside, you went inside to the machine, you come outside again, now you're going back inside, but this time to an international institution, the United Nations. What's your sense of the state of kind of multilateral and international institutions? I mean, I guess for kind of 20, 30, 40 years, well, actually not much longer, internationalists have hoped that these institutions would start to have more authority, mm. would, would be better able to kind of galvanise the global community at points of crisis. Do you see a, a change? Do you think that we are going to see greater global governance over the next 20, 30 years? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really hard question. I mean, you, you, 
we need it more than ever. And at moments, there, there's extraordinary optimistic things that happen. You know, the recent climate change talks, for all their faults, was a huge change moment, despite the failures at Copenhagen. We agreed also this year these new goals for 2030 to end child deaths, to end extreme poverty, all through the United Nations. But I also think, you know, the United Nations, which are really just the member states, not the UN agencies or the Secretary General, have also failed to step up to the mark in some of the greatest challenges of our time. I mean, I despair about Syria. I mean, I've been going um, to Lebanon and Jordan, and our teams are working in Syria as we speak, in the toughest places. And it just feels like that's a massive failure of international global governance and multilateralism. And we have to, I think, be honest that, it, that, that, that multilateralism and global governance doesn't work in those most extreme situations. But I don't think it's all a complete failure. So we've got to build on the successful parts. We've got to keep moving forwards. Because I, I think despite the power of charities, despite the importance of the private sector and even individual governments, we can't solve some of these great problems of our time, whether it's inequality, poverty, climate change, migration, without multilateralism. So we've got to keep making it work as well as it can. And on that Syria point, just to finish on that before we open it up, you've, as I said, you were inside and you're now, you've been campaigning and Save the Children. Do you think it has been and continues to be a zero-sum game between what the public will accept and what ought to be done in humanitarian grounds or could there have been and is there now possible a better way of being able to square the circle of public concerns about migration and people coming in and the legitimacy and separating out refugees and migrants all this kind of stuff and the simple burning humanitarian need which you talked about. I think it could go either way, which is the point about human agency and all of our responsibilities in this room. It felt there was a moment with the death. I know it's only one boy, but Alan Kurdi really moved all of us. Uh, maybe, you know, we've both got three-year-old mm. children, and I think when you see that little boy washed up on the beach or on the shores of Europe, I think it moved us all to tears. And I think that outpouring of support for refugees and Syrians was really remarkable, and it did move public opinion. It led to... Angela Merkel rebranding Germany based not just on Alan Kurdi but that whole situation and that was dramatic change but the backlash I think has also been quite strong so I think again this could go either way and 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 whether people in the end believe that we should come together we should go back to our values that we should speak up and stand with these refugees we should solve the root problems in Syria and other parts of the world and give you know, a lot of political attention to this, or we just draw up the, the drawbridge and kind of retreat into is isolationism. That, is, is that a failure of narrative? Do you think there's a way in which this is, should be being talked about that is being missed? Well, one of the things I do think is that, that has struck me, and I actually give a lot of credit to our, to our Prime Minister, even though I work for two other ones, David Cameron, I think, has been passionate on Syria and on aid and development. But overall, I do think in the world, in the last you know, several years, there has been a lack of G8 or G20 leaders really showing leadership. For long periods of time, people have been looking inward, not outward. Now, I think maybe the change might be the climate deal, maybe the refugee crisis, a rise of inequality, will force leaders, and actually Obama's having a run at this in the tail end of his presidency, but in general, the new leaders, the Chinas and Indias and Brazils, also haven't got an enormous amount of will at the moment to solve all of these global problems. So we're going to need, I think, as a public, as campaigners, to mobilise to keep our leaders' feet to the fire, because I don't think this will happen automatically. Great, thank you. OK, let's take some questions and points uh, from around the room, unless you've all been shocked into silence, which I can't possibly believe. <laughs> it never, too. ever happened at an RSA. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, wait, wait for the microphone. Thank you. And tell us your name, if you would. Nick Jones from Visa. Um, somewhat shocked to remember G8. It's a long time ago. It's yeah. a very effective mechanism, as, as you've explained. Yeah. In the world we're going into, media's fragmented. There are um, less moments when the world comes together. Do you see um, causes being diluted by those pressures? I know there's a kind of fatigue point as well. 
So I think that I agree very much with you, Nick. The world has completely changed. I was like, my Facebook point was a, was a kind of example of that, and we can't stand still, and we have to change if we're going to, in a way. It's the whole theme of, 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 of my talk. But I don't think it's more fragmented. I think there is fragmentation, but there are moments, actually, the whole world has the same conversation. You know, when that girl was raped on that bus, sadly and tragically in India, that led to a global discussion about violence against girls in not just India but around the world. When Alan Kurdi was washed up on that beach, it led to a global conversation in America, not just here in Europe, maybe not so much with that one in China, and we monitor these things as much as possible, but it led to a global conversation. So I think the way the social media combined with the formal media, the way the world works at the moment, there are moments actually when you can move the goalposts of, 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 of conversations and change public opinion. What I would say the lesson for campaigners of that is, is, you know, we've all traditionally planned campaigns, but the better thing to do is to ride waves occasionally and then try and change debates. And, you know, Gert Leopold, one of the founders of Greenpeace, always said to me, is be a kind of sailing ship tacking into the wind, not a super tanker where you kind of set off and never change direction until you hit an iceberg. So and I think that is a big lesson of modern campaigning. Um, Hi there, my name is Andrew Lamb. I'm a fellow of the RSA and um, a board member of a charity called Red R that trains aid workers, including yeah. Save the Children's staff. Um, I, was, I want to get your opinion on comparing what might be described as a, a big international NGO with big business um, and how, where the differences are and what, where the contrasts are. In particular, one of the things that um, is always uh, thrown at charities is um, it's almost like the, you want to be more efficient, you want to be more business-like, more professional, as if you know the business sector has the monopoly on professionalism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not just in terms of overheads and things, but this issue of complexity and dealing in a more complex world. Well, mm -hmm. you're advocating for charities to sort of embrace that complexity in their culture. Um, whereas a lot of businesses might try and externalize that complexity and have more sort of top-down command and control systems in place, which may be more efficient. But, you know, could you say a little bit about how you think your lessons, um, how you think Save the Children compares to a big, big business and whether mm. the lessons would be different? And in particular, just building on that, mm. I mean, this is something you hinted at in your, in your speech, that... that leaders have to distinguish between their mission and their organization, yeah. their own organization's yeah. size and their own kind of status. And that's not an easy thing to do as a leader because no. you can't help thinking, well, actually, I'm judged by how well my organization is doing. Yeah. And that's an easier thing to measure than the overall impact on the mission. Yeah. No, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, and, and I, I think that we've tried to build Save the Children as a very strong organization that appeals to millions of people, but at the same time build these wider movements and alliances for change for the reason you say. And, and, and it's actually not always been popular internally because we do need to raise money and all the rest of it, even though we have done well as a, as a, as a, as a, as a result of the strategies. But in terms of being like a big business, I mean, I'm not critical of all big businesses. I think some big businesses are doing extraordinary things. Others are really missing in action and we should challenge them. But I don't think a charity should be like a big business. I mean, I think people join charities because of their values. And actually why they stay is because they feel that they're in a place where they can make a difference for the things that they believe in. But also, it needs to be professional and efficient because I think otherwise people won't support us. If people giving us money feel we're wasting that money, we're not making most impact. All I would like to do is to move the benchmark away from CO salaries, not just because of my own, um, an administrative cost, which should be scrutinized and, and looked at, to how much impact you have, the outcomes you achieve for your mission, in our case, children. And I think why we need to be professional and efficient is to achieve those things linked to our values. But as I said in my talk, um, I think the thing that I've struggled most with with Save the Children, are people from Save the Children here, they can say themselves, but is actually creating the right enabling culture within the organisation that does link our mission, our values, with the more kind of edgy, controversial strategies. I mean, we, uh, you know, we've done even more than GlaxoSmithKline. We had a campaign with the Sun newspaper 
um, which is one of our big campaigns in the UK, is, to, is, a, is again an alliance. It's read on, get on. It's about getting every ch child reading well in Britain, particularly <coughs> early intervention at very young children. It's part of our programmes. But we knew we had to reach a new audience, so we deliberately chose The Sun, and they ran a brilliant campaign. But it didn't go down well in Save the Children. And I'm not saying that it was a wrong thing to do, but how you make those decisions linked to your values, the conversations you have internally, I think are different from how decisions are made in the private sector. At the back. Thank you. I'm David Thomas. There's an extent to which the amount of money going to charities is a zero-sum game and, and to which charities have to compete against each other for the same money and have to incur all of the costs involved in that. And I was just wondering what your reflections were on, on the costs and benefits of, of the necessary sort of competition between charities that we see and whether you have any views on whether there's anything that we could do at the level of, of larger organisations to try and improve the sort of market that there is really for, for charitable funding. I don't, I don't believe um, the market's saturated at all using business language, and especially not around the world, let alone here in Britain. I think the problem is, is that charities haven't modernised the way they engage with their supporters, and we also do it in quite a costly way based on an old fundraising model. We've got to engage our supporters much more as partners using digital in two-way communication rather than just pushing things at them through mail drops or phone calls from call centres. There's a revolution that's going to have to happen in fundraising that will actually be good for charity because it will lead to a higher quality um, relationship. And I, I think that there's a huge amount of people in this country that will do even more with char charities, whether it's volunteering, giving money, or campaigning, if we get our engagement to a better level. And also, we keep focused on the cause and the outcome, rather than charities looking like, which is the point from, the, from before about, uh, about businesses. So I don't think we're anywhere close to a limit on um, how much people will give. And I think actually people are giving more, not less, um, overall. But do you think sometimes those things, Justin, are intention, which is that, you know, we've seen over the last, you know, many years, enormous amounts of innovation, or quite a lot of innovation and uh, use of data to target people as sources of money and, mm. you know, big departments focused on that fundraising in large charities. But engagement is, it seems to me, often been left behind. But we're still to. trying to engage people in the same kind of mm. ways as we were before. We still have a kind of problem about the fact there's a small group of activists and then there's the general mm. public who get engaged at particular moments, but generally speaking, not. So is there a danger that, you know, you're running an organisation and there's someone who says, look, I can, you know, interrogate the database, send out lots of direct mail, put an advert in the newspaper and raise, you know, half a million quid for you and we can do stuff with it. Or else there's a really messy, difficult, complex process of trying to talk to people which may or may not reap results. And so in the end, people do the former rather than the latter. I think, I think that's, ex that's, that's spot on. And I think there is a danger that fundraising has become a bit industrial. And I think that's your, your point. But I also think the way to solve that is to actually look at much more sophisticated ways of engaging people digitally and face-to-face -face and in other ways that does have that kind of um, engagement. What, what, you know, we spend a lot of money to raise and recruit uh, uh, um, supporters. But actually what was interesting, for example, in that new recent refugee crisis is that some individuals, I won't name the person, raised half a million pounds themselves using social media with very little input from us, but, uh, but took all the content from all around the media, from us and others, and we just had a dialogue with them about what they were going to do. So I think we've got to revolutionise the way we engage supporters and not just treat them as, 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 as you say, as people to raise money for. But it, it does mean, I think, that we have to fit fix the back of what we do, not just the front, because I think to be able to do that more sophisticated engagement is a lot digital. I think many charities, including Save the Children, are a bit in the car behind on the digital revolution. And if we're going to catch up, I think it will allow us to have that more sophisticated two-way two dialogue. And, and as part of this, and you can see I'm continuing to ask questions because you're not. Um, uh, you. But if I say, ah, oh, there's a hand, very good. And there's another one. Threatened by me asking another question, suddenly hands emerged <laughs> everywhere. Very good. Why don't we take these three together? And then I think we'll be running out of time. So uh, you first, and there's someone there, and then Laura. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, John French. 
Would you not agree, Justin, that a capitalist society is incongruent with charitable giving? And uh, sorry, a, a, a capitalist society? Um, How, say a bit more. Why? Would you, I put it to you that potentially that's incongruent with charitable giving. In, in, you know, you've, you're in a quite a unique position. You're a, you've worked in government and you're now working in the charitable sector. That's, that's, I'd imagine that's relatively unique, although, excuse my ignorance, you have been involved in government when the UK, correct me if I'm wrong, had the highest level of children living under the poverty line in Europe for a period of time. How, how do you, you say, square the circle mm. in relation to that? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I get that. So that's, I mean, in a way, that's a kind of sticking plaster versus systemic reform yeah. kind of challenge, I guess. Um, yes, where was that? Oh, very good. Hi, Camilla Pallison. Um, how do you think, or what do you think is the effect of government funding on charities being able to affect change in terms of what, what they get funding for, um, especially in terms of creating that powerful platform? About, in, in the sense of whether they're muzzled as a result of taking money? Yeah, well, yeah, and, and what they're allowed to spend money on, yeah. I guess. And this must have been particularly challenging for you because, you know, you're, you're in a country which is very doing very positive stuff on aid, but at the same time you're campaigning very strongly yeah. around Syria, so that's a yeah. balance you're working with all the time. And then finally... Hi, we've got a question from Twitter from Andrea Siodmuk, who asks, what will be different in 10 years' time from now? Presumably not, like, everything. This is not, this is <laughs> on this topic, precisely. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> You can just choose one thing if you want. So I definitely don't think um, we should just be sticking plasters. So sometimes we are, and being a sticking plaster isn't always bad. I've been in some of these terrible humanitarian emergencies, and you're just happy to keep people alive, and it is sticking plaster. You're not solving it. You're, you know, you're there for the moment. But I think we have to do transformational change. The thing I've learned from doing the inside or the outside or working with the private sector is actually all of those coming together is the most powerful um, way of achieving change. I passionately believe we need governments and we need multilateral institutions. I believe in the United Nations. Charities and the private sector can't replace them. But we also need the power and innovation of the private sector, their research and development, the good bits of the private sector. And we need charities who can often do things that governments and the private sector can't. And I think when we've had that combination, I mean, as we're trying to do, for example, I mentioned earlier with this company, Reckitt Benkiza, RB, we have a campaign with them to end children dying of diarrhea in India, in Pakistan, Nigeria, and other places. What they're bringing to the table is actually two new products. One of them is a sprinkle you put down a pit latrine to stop rotavirus, another a soap for newborns. We're working with the UN on a seven-point plan in countries that dramatically reduces diarrhea. We're working with the British government and the Indian and others to do this. It's that combination. Now, the Indian government weren't going, or the British government weren't going to invent those two products, but also RB weren't going to be able to run that program in the Swat Valley of Pakistan. So, you know... I, is that combination that, that makes, it, makes, makes a difference. But I think we also need campaigning because we shouldn't be under any illusion that there are massive injustices in the world and speaking out and challenging power is an important part of what charities do. It's not just partnerships and working with people. Um, on the government funds... And, and it's easy to... Uh, but that's the second question. Yeah. Easy to achieve that balance. You can be on the... Today programme in the morning kind of saying the government should be doing more and then in the afternoon with the Secretary of State working collaboratively. It's possible to do that? I think in Britain it's still possible, but there are moments where you do get challenged both, both ways about whether you're speaking out. I think that's why, in a way, my point about going back to your essence and core is so important. Because it's very hard to, in the end, I got a lot of stick um, for speaking out about these Gazan children that were killed. I mean, enormous amount. And I'm actually personally very pro, I, I can say that we can be open, I'm pretty pro-Israel. And I also know among some parts of the left is a cover for anti-Semitism, and I'm very critical of that. But I know what the Israeli government did in that Gazan situation was appalling. And so, um, in terms of indiscriminate bombing that led to many children dying, much bigger than any other conflict between Israel and Palestine. So, I think if you're on your very essence and core, and you're doing it based on your values, you can be bolder and speak out. And that applies to our government as well as um, the Israeli or Palestinian issue. 
um, different in 10 years. I think this is, in, in, in a way, the most exciting thing, is that if we get some of these things right, whether it's the unusual alliances, creating global public goods, this new form of communication that can be truly mass, um, how we actually then organisations play their role but don't always have to lead all of it, I think we can do extraordinary things. I do, no, no I, I didn't say it flippantly in my talk, and maybe this would be the, the issue I would highlight rather than mentioning them all, is that w no other generation has ever been able to say that they could end child deaths from preventable causes for under five children, from diarrhea, pneumonia, malaria. No other generation has ever been able to say that. Now, we'll never reduce it to zero, but we can all but reduce it to zero in the next 15, maybe not 10 years. And that now is the global goal that the United Nations set in September. And we'll do that through human agency and campaigning, but also harnessing the private sector, governments and charities. And I think that's an amazing opportunity for all of us to be part of and if we can do that in our lifetime when no other generation has ever been able to do something so extraordinary that would be something that we could all be very proud of and I think that's the difference I'm really feel that in my time at Save the Children and now going on to work at the UN I feel very proud and privileged and honoured actually to have had a chance to play a small part towards. Well thank you Justin. Um, there was one particular moment in your speech that really hit home for me, which was the, you talking about being in Downing Street and having a, a, something so important to say to the Prime Minister, you had to ring him when he was in his, one of his planes and suggesting that I might too. My Romo was write, writing his jokes, so I'm not sure that there was ever call for me to be disturbing him uh, <laughs> as he flew around the world. Uh, it was a brilliant speech. Uh, thank you uh, for your questions and for asking them so uh, uh, honestly and clearly. Thank you all for coming tonight. Can you, I can ask you to join me in thanking Justin Forsyth.